Well, good morning. Quite a storm, huh? I was uh, outside yesterday enjoying the hundred and something degree temperature and saw the big clouds coming in and I was thinking to myself, boy, this rain is sure going to be good for the trees. <laughs> and I, uh, I woke up this morning and my neighbor's tree was completely down, uh, fortunately had fallen away from the house. Uh, and then I began my drive here, and uh, trees every which direction, uh, branches and trees in the median side of the road, parking lots uh, torn up and ripped apart, and uh, I don't know, maybe just a, a small reminder on my way in that sometimes the things that we think are best for us uh, end up being the worst for us. My name is uh, Joshua. I'm a writer and speaker, and uh, this is my home church. Uh, Joe Darigo called me uh, many months ago, around the turn of the year, and said, hey, I'd like you to come speak in July. Uh, your, topic is the, the, your topic is when less is more. And uh, I said, perfect. I am your guy. And then he said, great. Uh, your subtitle is money. And I thought, oh, that's going to be a little harder. <clears throat> Beginning a series today on making change, uh, specifically about money, specifically about finances. Uh, I think Joe was serious uh, when he wanted to talk, when he wanted me to talk about when less is more, and specifically in relation to money, and in relation to finances, and in relation to wealth. And so that is the direction that I intend to go this morning. Uh, however, uh, just this past week, I was reading, there's an interesting epidemic uh, in America. I don't know if epidemic might be a bit of a hyperbole, but there's an interesting problem in America. And the problem that people are writing about is the fact that nobody cares about warning labels anymore. That uh, there are so many warning labels on things that they have it, just essentially, we don't even care. Uh, there's too many of them. We don't think they apply to us. We don't think the danger is all that great. And so fewer and fewer people, scientifically studied, are reading and paying attention to warnings that are being put out there. Some of these are actually quite important, however. Uh, they kind of track the history of warning labels in America. It started in the 1920s when they required warning labels on poison, which makes sense. Uh, the 1930s, then they began expanding it to food and drug and cosmetics. Uh, in the 1960s, they required that cigarette makers would begin putting warning labels on their packages. Uh, but apparently in the 1980s is when everything changed and everything blew up and the government, uh, both state and federal, began requiring warning labels on just about anything that, that offered even the little hint of danger to a person to the point now where uh, people don't read them. And uh, this has bad consequences. Number one, we're not familiar with what the warnings are. But number two, a second consequence they were pointing out, interestingly enough, is that warning labels are becoming less of a deterrent for manufacturers. Uh, it used to be you could require a manufacturer to put a warning label if they used a certain chemical or use a certain process in creating this product because they knew it would hurt sales. Uh, however, now that nobody cares, uh, this no longer works as a deterrent in any way. This idea of ignoring warnings and ignoring warning labels is not all that uncommon. There's a uh, famous gentleman named Cyril Evans uh, in April of 1912. Uh, he was on board the SS Californian. Uh, he was crossing the Atlantic Ocean from England to the U.S. Uh, when he encountered this huge field of ice. Uh, the uh, operator of the ship uh, required him to begin calling all the local ships in the area, warning them about the upcoming ice so they would be familiar and they would be to, uh, able to avoid it. Uh, one of the calls he made, uh, the Titanic, and uh, warned them about the ice coming, but uh, his uh, warning was virtually ignored. Uh, he ended up having to testify quite a bit as they began badgering him a little about Bit, trying to place some of the blame for the, uh, for the uh, sinking of the Titanic on him, uh, when he made this very important and fascinating quote to the, to the judge. He said, look, I did all I could do. 
I couldn't steer the ship for them. Very true, I think. Warning labels are what they are. Warnings are warnings. Warnings are offered. It is up to the receiver to act appropriately when they receive them. Which then brings me to our conversation this morning. I want to talk about some of the often overlooked, never discussed dangers of wealth. Some of the dangers of money, because when I read the Bible, when I read the Old Testament, when I read specifically the New Testament and what Jesus has to say, I find that Jesus offered numerous, many warnings to those with wealth. As a matter of fact, I don't remember where I first heard it, but someone once said, when you read the New Testament, money almost sounds more like a danger than a blessing. I think he's very true. But in a society where more money is always better, and the idea of more wealth is never questioned, how in the world do we have this conversation? So I want to talk about that. I want to warn you a little bit. I've given this message several times and it has never gone well. <laughs> Literally, like three or four different times I have had this conversation and it never goes very well. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I uh, I even put, uh, pitched a book idea on this topic to some publishers and uh, they said, look, we like you but um, we don't think anyone's gonna buy this book. So uh, they wouldn't let me write it. But uh, I get to have the conversation here today. Uh, let me try and preface it by saying just a few things to try and cut off some of the things that I think make this not go well. So a couple things that I am not saying, no matter what I say later, I will not contradict any of these statements. So let's start here. Number one, I'm not saying that money is immoral. Money is not immoral. Money is only a tool to expedite trade, right? It's easier to take coins to the market than chickens to buy jeans. And so we have money to make trade easier. We find, uh, we find this idea even sanctioned by God in the Old Testament where he says, sell your doves here and then buy some more when you get to the temple. So uh, money is not immoral. It is only a tool. I'm also not saying that you cannot be rich and be a faithful follower of Jesus. We find plenty of examples in the Bible of wealthy men and women who were praised by God and by Jesus for being faithful followers of him. We also find people who are poor who are faithful followers of him. I'm not saying that you can't be that. I'm also not anti-capitalist. I feel like I just want to throw that out there and uh, start there. I'm not anti-capitalist. Personal property is normative in scripture, so I'm not against that. I'm also not saying that we shouldn't work hard. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do the best work that we possibly can. I'm not saying that making money is wrong or making money is evil. I'm far more concerned with some of the words and some of the dangers that Jesus offers repeatedly to those who have acquired much through their lives. That is where we are going. My hope, I guess, more than anything else, uh, is that we will all steer our ships wisely. We will take heed to what Jesus has to say, and we will make smart decisions with our life going forward. I, uh, I feel like I... Um, Luke 18, I think, sets a, a pretty good precedent for the conversation that I want to have, and I think it sets a good, um, probably pretty good argument, uh, pretty good baseline for uh, where I want to go and how I want to um, frame this conversation going forward, which isn't easy in any stretch. In Luke 18, starting in verse 18, we have the story of the rich young ruler. In Luke 18, he is referred to as a certain ruler, or in this, uh, this uh, uh, on your screen, he's referred to as a local official. Uh, based on other accounts in the Gospels, we know that he was a wealthy uh, young man. 
One day, one of the local, fi- local officials asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Just a couple things on there. Number one, uh, I'm just going to make a couple assumptions I think we can get from his opening question. Number one, we find a, a person, we find a young man who, um, who has a high regard for Jesus. Uh, he calls him a good teacher. He knows that he is good. He knows that he has, he has much to learn from him. And so he is placing a little bit of trust and a little bit of faith in what Jesus has to say. He has a genuine question for him about life. Let's take a look at his specific question. What must I do to serve? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm going to come back to that to a moment. But let's remember that is the specific question. What must I do to deserve eternal life? Uh, Jesus in John defines eternal life for us. Uh, I think it's different than many of us seem to think. More on that in a second. He continues, Jesus says, why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't you? No illicit sex, no killing, no stealing, no lying. Honor your father and mother. The young man responds, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. I've kept them all for as long as I can remember. Okay. When Jesus heard this, he said, then there's only one thing left to do. Sell everything you own, give it away to the poor. You will have riches in heaven. Then come, follow me. The next verse. When the young man heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Might be a bit of an overstatement, but uh, one commentary uh, refers to this verse as the saddest verse in all of Scripture. That here was this young man face to face with Jesus, face to face with the prospect of eternal life. Jesus told him what he needed to do, sell everything you have, come follow me. And the man turned away sad. Sad, why? Sad because he knew Jesus had everything he wanted. That Jesus was good. That he was a wise teacher. That he indeed had the right formula for living here and for eternity. And yet faced with the prospect of being separated from his money, he couldn't go through with it. And so he walked away sad. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so a couple things. I just want to set the stage here on a a couple things here. Uh, Number one, in John 10.10, Jesus defines eternal life. Jesus says, this is eternal life. Actually, I think I have the verse wrong. Someone might want to correct me. But in John, Jesus, does, Jesus defines eternal life. And he says, this is eternal life, that you would know God and the one whom he sent. That you would know me and the one who sent me. This was Jesus' definition of eternal life. When we hear eternal life, most often we think of getting into heaven when we die. So the young man comes to Jesus and he says, what do I have to do to inherit inherit eternal life? And we read it and we think, the young man's asking Jesus, how do I get into heaven? But that's not what Jesus was hearing. That's not what Jesus was answering. For Jesus, the kingdom of God began right now, today. That the kingdom of God is something that we live in now, in the present. It's not something for the future, but it is a current reality that we would live today in the kingdom of God, experiencing eternal life today. So this, I think, sets the table then for what this conversation is about. It's not a conversation of, can a rich, wealthy man or woman enter heaven? That's not what he's answering. He's answering the question, how does a wealthy, 
rich person walk fully in the kingdom of God today? And Jesus says, this is really hard to do. He continues on, not on the screen, verse 26, they didn't really understand. And they said, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. In other words, this is hard. Walking fully in the kingdom today when you have means and wealth is difficult, but it is possible through the Spirit of God. But I want to focus on the first part, at least at the beginning. Why is this so difficult? Why is it hard with means to walk fully in the kingdom of God? Why does Jesus go so far as to say at one point, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are well fed. Blessed are the poor. The Bible mentions many warnings, many, I think, effects that wealth can have on us that keeps us from fully experiencing all the benefits and all the happiness and all the joy and all the fulfillment that we find when we walk fully in the kingdom of God. Let me run through a few of them. Number one, our wealth often becomes a relational barrier. Our wealth often becomes a relational barrier and our money gets in the way of our relationship with other people. In uh, 2011, uh, Boston College did a, what is probably one of the most extensive studies that has ever been done on what they were calling the ultra-rich. Uh, they did this survey of um, ultra-rich uh, human beings. The average net worth was like 80 million of the people that they, uh, that they um, surveyed and had to fill out all these questions and forms. And, uh, they, uh, they started to look for some common themes and look for some common things that were taking place in the lives of the ultra-rich. And uh, they found three specific fears um, of the ultra-rich, uh, three fears that were beginning to pop up. Uh, number one, um, people who are ultra-rich um, feel that they have lost the ability to complain uh, or to be honest about what's going on in their life. Uh, they feel that they, have, that they have lost the right to complain about anything that's happening in them or around them uh, because everyone will just think they're ungrateful uh, if they have this much money and they have anything left to complain about. So that was one of their fears. Uh, a second fear of those who have a, a, a ton of money is uh, they worry a, a ton for their children. Uh, they worry about what kind of kids are going to be raised in this type of environment uh, and in this type of family. Uh, they worry what the children are going to think of them if they lose some of the money or if they end up donating most of it to charity. Uh, they're a little worried about what that, what that decision is going to mean to their relationship. But by far, the most common fear among the ultra-rich is isolation. That they don't have any true friends. That all the people that are around them pretend to like them only because they have a lot of money. That there are certain expectations on what this relationship is going to bring to that person or how this person is going to, how they're going to treat this certain person. That this is by far their greatest fear. They were talking about the ultra rich. But I think when you bring it down to our level, can't you still start to see some of the same themes? That oftentimes wealth can become a relational barrier. That we buy our house in the suburbs and we drive our car into the garage and we walk right into the house and we never have to talk to any of the neighbors. Uh, that there are certain expectations on us. I have a, a friend, he doesn't make a lot of money, uh, but his siblings make far less money. Uh, and he told me one time that he would never dream of telling his family members how much money he makes. Because he knows as soon as he did, certain things would change in their relationship. Money can become a relational barrier 
in our lives. A second danger of wealth is that wealth can often lead to pride and arrogance. Proverbs 28, 11 says it this, the rich are wise in their own eyes. The rich are wise in their own eyes. Um, we often believe when we begin to do well financially, we often believe that we've done this by our own cleverness, We've done this by our own hard work. We've done this by our own discipline. And I'm not saying that isn't the case. But too much of that entirely removes God from the blessing, from the, from the, uh, from the equation. I mean, even the, if, even the initial thought of, hey, look how much I've earned. Look how much I've made. Look what I've done with my life. At the very heart of that is the fact that God gave you certain talents and blessings and skills and strengths, a certain personality. He puts you in a certain position, whether it was positive or negative. It certainly shaped who you are and what you have become. He put the people around you that have helped make you who you are. But it seems the more we accumulate, the more we achieve, the less we consider that, and the more we begin to give the credit all to ourselves. And the more times you are right in your decision making, the less likely you are to think that you'll ever be wrong again in the future. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I've achieved a certain level. I've made it to a certain point in life. I've reached a certain point on the ladder above these people. Apparently, I make pretty good decisions. Apparently, I'm right about a lot of things. I must be right about a lot of things. Or I never would have gotten to this point. The more comfortable and successful we become in the material world, the less likely we are to fully grasp our fallenness in the spiritual world. Our fallenness, our need for salvation in the first place, and our fallenness in our need for the Spirit of God and our sanctification and holiness going forward. Wealth becomes a relational barrier. Wealth, wealth often leads to pride and arrogance. Wealth often leads to feelings of self-sufficiency. That's the third one. Wealth often leads to feelings of self-sufficiency. It is very difficult to have to trust God for your next meal when you have a freezer full of food in your kitchen or so much food in your freezer that you've had to purchase a second one in your garage. Ezekiel 28.5 God gives a warning to the king of Tyre. He says, because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. And he begins to share with him the prophecy of how he is about to tear it all down and humble him. Riches, riches can begin to dull our senses of needs for God's provision in the future. Six years ago, uh, this month, I was in San Salvador, El Salvador, uh, with a group of students. And uh, we happened to meet this uh, lady named uh, Lu Lucila, Lu Lucila, and uh, we were meeting in her home, uh, which was about 10 by 20 feet, uh, dirt floor. Uh, it was her and her two daughters that lived in this home. Uh, one daughter was 15, the other daughter was three. Uh, the 15-year-old had been diagnosed with a, a terminally uh, ill disease that was attacking her bones. Uh, this disease would eventually kill her, but in the present moment, it caused her excruciating and unrelenting pain. Uh, we were in the front room meeting with the mother and the three-year-old daughter who I remember vividly um, walking to one side of the room, grabbing a coloring book and some colors and sitting on the floor and uh, began flipping to the first page of the coloring book uh, to find it was colored. She flipped to the next page, 
both colored. Next page, next page. I watched her as she flipped through every single page of the coloring book to discover that they had all already been colored. And I, I'm flashing back to my home where my daughter probably has a cupboard full of coloring books, most of them with like two pages color in them. Oh, how I longed to just hand an empty coloring book to this three-year-old. We were in the front room, and the, in the back room was the 15-year-old the daughter and, uh, and the chickens that they, that they raised. Uh, they would hope each morning that the chickens would give eggs. Uh, this is what they sold, uh, and then this is what they used to provide. We were talking to the mother. Uh, she, of course, didn't have any of the, the money uh, needed um, for, the, for the food to feed three people uh, or to purchase the, the medication, which would relieve her daughter's pain. The medication was about $20, uh, but she didn't have it. And we began asking her and talking to her about it and like, what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do? What, 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 how are you going to provide? And she just responded with just like a, a simple sentence. God will take care of us. God's going to provide. God always provides for us somehow in some way. I looked at the faith of that woman and it occurred to me that she has a level of faith and trust and relationship in God for her daily needs that I have never even begun to experience. I've never, most of us have never begun to understand that level of intimacy and trust in God. Why? Because my pantry's already full of food to last for a month if I wanted to. It was a, it's always interesting, I took a number of students to developing nations and saw the neighborhoods and, and saw the people and the, the way that they lived. And, and uh, it, there was this very interesting progression that, that almost every student would go on uh, when we would take them out of America and into how most of the world lives. And uh, they would always make these interesting comments where at first they would be so saddened by the state of poverty that these people were living in. And then something would happen. Usually we would go to a church service and you would see people praying and worshiping and soaking in God and each other. And you would be shocked. The students would be shocked at the level of faith and joy and happiness that these people had. Almost a trust in each other and a trust in God that was almost like incredibly desirable, like I wish I loved God that much. I wish I had that much faith. And then a third step would always happen where we would get back to the, the camp and we'd get back to going home and they would just begin, it's very, I, I don't know the fine line here, but they would be so thankful to God for all the things they had when they got back home. And I'm, I am not against thanking God for the good gifts that he has given us. That is not what this is about. But I couldn't help but think, is it possible that all the things that we have that we define as good could be the actual things that are keeping us from experiencing the faith and intimacy and joy and relationship that people without them experience. I think that's what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about walking in the kingdom of God, how difficult it is. Now tragedy comes, right? Tragedy strikes, trial comes, things happen that, that, that knock us off the top of the ladder and back down to our knees where we know that we have nothing left but to trust in God and put our faith in Him and help Him to see us through this moment. And then He does. And we're thankful and we're closer to God because of it. 
So things happen, I think, that bring about that faith, but when you have to live it day in and day out, something very different takes place. Number four, uh, wealth can dull our senses to the needs around us. Wealth begins to dull our senses to the needs around us. Uh, two psychologists at Berkeley ran a number of tests to determine how wealth impacts empathy and compassion. I think this is where people start to really hate what I'm saying. <clears throat> They uh, ran these tests to determine how wealth impacts empathy and compassion, and this is what they found. That less affluent individuals are more likely to report feeling compassion towards others on a regular basis. For example, they are more likely to agree with statements such as, I often notice people who need help, and it's important to take care of people who are vulnerable. The psychologist went on to say that their theory was that wealth and abundance give us a sense of freedom and independence from others. And the less we have to rely on others, the less we care about their feelings. And this then leads to affluency and self-focus. This is hard to hear. These are hard warnings to hear. But the statistics back up everything they say. And it probably is the reason why people who make 50 to 75% income give on average 7.6% of their income. Those who make over 100,000 give 4.2% of their income. And those who make over 200,000 give 2.8% of their income. That the more money people make, the less percentage they give to charity. Uh, I think many of the, the realities I've already talked about contribute to this, right? The, the, the more money we have, the, less, uh, the more likely we are to kind of pull out of that environment and put ourselves in the, in the suburbs, in the nice neighborhood, you know, with, with other people who have means. And we just begin to, to lose sight of what it looks like, how other people live, the struggle that they go through. It also, I think, should strike a chord in the, in the heart of anyone who, whose thinking is, look, I'm, I'm just trying to make more money so I can give more. Uh, once I start making more, I'll be able to give more. Uh, the, the numbers just don't back that up. A couple more. Uh, wealth divides our loyalties. Uh, Matthew 6 says no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Uh, we, of course, would never admit it, right? Nobody loves money. Everybody just wants more of it. Uh, the reality is that the more wealth we have, the more we tend to accumulate. Uh, the houses get bigger, the cars get nicer, uh, the more stuff we put in our closets and in our drawers and in our garages. And while we would never say that we are serving money, we have slowly gotten ourselves to a point where we're spending more and more of our time and energy taking care of our physical things and absolutely Wealth has begun to divide our loyalty between the things of God and the things of this world. Wealth by itself never fulfills its promise. Uh, wealth never does bring us happiness. It never brings us full security. It can bring a level of security, but never brings enough full security. Uh, we constantly uh, continue to seek more and more. And then this is the, my last point here, the last and final point danger, warning, reality that often keeps wealthy from fully walking in the kingdom of God is this. That wealth entirely blinds us to the effect that it's having on us. That wealth entirely blinds us to the reality of all these things happening and taking place in our hearts. Because most of us would never define ourselves as wealthy. We're not the wealthy ones. We're not the rich ones. It's always somebody else. This is why I think it is so common to make, uh, to say disparaging marks about the wealthy in political campaigns. <laughs> because no one thinks you're talking about them. <laughs> Everyone thinks you're talking about someone else 
who is greedy and selfish and immoral. Nobody thinks any of this applies to them. This is the greatest danger of us all. We can name 100 people who are wealthy and are rich, and we would never include ourselves among them. We can look around the room and we can make judgments and assumptions. I know what he does. I know what she does. I know what they do. I know how he's dressed. I know what that person's driving. They probably have means. Me, I'm struggling to get by every single day. These warnings about the rich and the wealthy cannot apply to me. We compare ourselves up almost exclusively, but when we begin to compare ourselves down, we find a very different picture. Nearly half of the world lives on less than $2 a day. Less than half, nearly half of the world lives on just $2 per day. Here's some other stats based on a nonprofit called Giving What We Can. A minimum wage job in the U.S., which is $7.25 per hour. If you work a minimum wage job in the U.S., you are in the top 8% of wage earners in the world. In Arizona, the minimum wage is $10, which would put you in the top 7% worldwide of wage earners. And anyone who makes $40,000 a year annual income you live in the top 2% of the world. And yet all these warnings to the wealthy and to the rich, we overlook. Well, it doesn't apply to me. Can't be talking about me. Must be talking about someone else. My friends, these warnings are for me and these warnings are for you. That when Jesus warns that those with wealth will have a hard time walking fully in the kingdom of God, he's talking about you and he's talking about me. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't those among us with financial needs. I understand that. But for the vast majority of us, these are warnings that we need to heed, that we can steer our ship wisely. And how do we do it? Three final thoughts. How do we do this well? I'll fly through these quickly. Number one, I think, number one, I think that we have got to embrace healthy doubt. Embrace healthy doubt. I think it is wise to often question, am I walking fully in the kingdom of God with my finances? Am I doing all that God calls me to do with my money? Am I letting arrogance and pride and self-sufficiency? Am I looking for happiness and security? Am I letting some of those things creep into my life? Mm, I think maybe I am. I think that's a healthy posture to take. Because it's in that posture of humility and doubt that God's able to reveal things and churn things inside of our hearts and open up new thoughts and new ideas and call us into a new journey forward. Man, I, I'll just do a quick plug. Three more weeks of this Making Change series, I, man, I would come to every single one of them. I would come to every single one of them and I would come and I would say, God, what do you have to say to me today? I don't wanna miss out on anything that you are offering me. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? Maybe he's got something for you. Maybe he doesn't, but can't hurt to be here and listen to what God might be wanting to say. Second step is to live simply. Um, having money is never a license to buy more, I don't think. Uh, I, don't, I think um, if, you're, if your only filter for making a purchase is do I have the money to buy it, I think that's a very poor, short-sighted filter. Uh, I think that this whole idea of just buying the things that we need is, uh, is genius <laughs> and is wonderful and is a life-giving way to live life. And then number three, we live generously. You can give. You can give. You have room to give in your life. And as you become more generous, 
you will begin to, the, 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 the hold that money has on you, the influence that wealth has on you, will begin to erode and it will begin to slow. I was watching a, an interview years ago with a guy named uh, Francis Chan, uh, a pastor of this large church in California, uh, wrote a lot of books that sold a ton of copies and continue to sell a ton of copies. And uh, he ended up leaving his church so that he could go move into downtown uh, LA and begin uh, working with the people who were, who were struggling to get by. And uh, he was being interviewed, really actually quite interrogated, I think, by some people. Like, do you really think you're supposed to leave your pastoral ministry? You had, you had this amazing ministry. You're reaching all these people. You're impacting the, the world. And you're going to leave it all behind just to go live in downtown L.A. in this small little, small little apartment uh, among people who, uh, who need you. And um, he, he made this statement where he said... Um, he said, look, uh, my wife and I have always loved living simply. We've always loved living in a small place, having just a few things. We've always loved that lifestyle. The one thing that we always wanted to accompany it is being generous as well. <laughs> he said, when I was poor, we could live simply, but I didn't have the means to be generous. He said, but now that I've reached a certain point in my life, now that there's more money coming in than I need for my daily needs, I've got this dream life where I'm able to live simply and be generous because of it. I personally can't think of a better way to live life, that we would live simple and generous. And I think that this is a life that is available to far more of us than we realize. Heavenly Father, um, may all these words uh, be true of me. Uh, may all these words be true of us. Uh, Father, I do pray. God, I, 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 God, I think my, my biggest fear and my biggest desire and, and my want more than anything else is that somehow this would be a positive conversation God, that we would not walk out of here um, feeling bad, uh, feeling lectured to. God, instead, my hope, and I'm probably going to need your spirit to, to accomplish this, is that we would instead feel invited. God, that your warnings, that all the words that you had for those with means God, that it was not to put them down, but it was simply to warn us of the dangers ahead so that we could live more fully in relationship with you, more entirely in the kingdom. God, that we would experience all the fulfillment and purpose that you offer to those who follow you and walk in your spirit. God, may that be the attitude, may that be the thought that leaves our minds, that leaves, the, we leave in our minds today. You're inviting us to something far greater and something far better than the world can ever provide. And that we would stop looking for it to satisfy our soul and find it entirely in you. In Jesus' name, amen.